Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And for animal biology today, we're going to talk about tenophora. So if you remember the last few lectures, one was going to, one was on periphera, sponges. Then the next was on nideria, the jellies and, and coral. And now we're going to talk about tenophora, which are sometimes called the cone jellies, okay? Or the cone jellyfish. Now they superficially do look like jellyfish, but they're when you start looking at the anatomy and you look at the diversity, there also is a lot of variation that we don't see in Nidarians. Okay? So we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about tenophora. It's not a very big group. Uh, there's not as much known about tenophora as some of the other groups. But um, again, it plays an important role, role in the evolution of animals. Okay, so this is an example of tenophora. This is a comb jelly. Okay, and you can see uh, the combs right here, and we'll talk more about these in a second. But they are laced with cilia, so they have little teeny hairs, and that's how the organism moves through the water column. All right, so some interesting things about tenophora that make them a little bit different than nideria. Okay, now they are completely different from periphera. Remember, periphera have no tissues. Um, they're asymmetrical, um, so there's no symmetry. Uh, you know, those are the really primitive animals that are just grouped cells. Um, that act together for a full organism. Tenophora, on the other hand, uh, is diploblastic, but in some cases, in some species, it could be triploblastic. Uh, and it really just depends on what your definition of tissue is. Uh, now, when we like start looking at tenophora, when we start looking into the layers of tissue, we start to see some interesting things. They have biradial symmetry. So that means that they have bilateral symmetry and radial symmetry. So they have them both. So not only can you divide them on the central axis, but you also divide them um, through the longitudinal plane. They have a mesoglia, which we've talked about before in Nideria. Okay? And so that's that jelly gelatinous material that's in between the ectodermis and the endodermis. Okay? And mesohol meso is what we find in periphera. But mesoglia is a little bit different, especially in tenophora, because tenophora have muscle cells inside their muscle mesoglia. True muscle cells. So this is that separation between diploblastic and triploblastic. So remember we're talking about ectodermis, the outside layer of an organism having unique ectodermal cells, cells that arise for um, you know the protection from the outer surface might have spines, different things on them, etc. Endodermis or gastrodermis, okay, specialized cells that are set up for digestive purposes and maybe some reproduction and this kind of stuff. And then the mesoglia in between. Well, in the case of tenophora, the mesoglia has muscle cells which originate on their own from mesoglia. So even though when we're looking at Nidarians, and we might see some cells inside the mesoglia, those cells are either coming from the ectodermis or the endodermis. In Tenophora, when we see cells inside the mesoglia, they are self-made, or they have evolved separately from the ectodermis and endodermis. So they are true muscle cells. Okay? That makes people lean towards tenophora, at least some species being triploblastic. Okay, just like Nidarians, they have a ga gastrovascular cavity. Uh, 
They have a nerve net. So again, um, a lot of similarities between Nideria and Tenophora. But instead of having nematocysts, right? And so you remember, uh, Nidarians have their own specialized cells, which allow them to sting um, their prey to, you know, uh, venomize their prey, put venom in their prey. Tenophora have another cell type. They do, well, I shouldn't say they don't have nematocysts. There is a group of Tenophora that do have nematocysts, right? which shows that connection between Nidarians and Tenophora. But most Tenophora have lost the nematocyst, and they have a specialized cell, a different specialized cell, which we call chloroblasts. Right? And the chloroblasts are, instead of stinging cells, they're adhesive cells. So they release a very sticky substance, Okay, and we'll talk about this in a second. Okay, that allows for it to capture prey and hold on to prey, and then they can consume them. So the reason why they are called comb jellies is because they have rows of combs, and so like a ridge that runs down the organism. And in Tenophora's case, there are eight comb row, comb rows. And so I'm going to show you a little video of a tenophora moving, and you can see the comb rows. If you look closely, you can see the individual um, combs or individual spots on the row moving. And that's the actual cilia that's in that region, region moving so the organism can move through the water column. So again, even though they do look like the, you know, the medusa phase of a Nidarian, they're very different in the sense that their tentacles are, are different uh, adhesive properties. The coloblasts are on their tentacles. Uh, they don't have nematocysts. Uh, these rows, these comb rows that you can see here that were beading and kind of colorful, that's laced with cilia, so that's how they move through the water column. So a little bit different, um, although definitely you can tell that they are kind of a sister group to Nideria. All right, so back to the mesoglia, just to kind of, you know, rehash this out. Because the mesoglia has true muscle cells, there are groups of individuals, okay, tenophora biologists, that believe this makes them the precursor to triploblastic organisms, and in fact, they might even be triploblastic organisms. Locomotion, like I said before, is through the comb rolls and the cilia that's attached to them. Okay, the tentacles themselves do not have nematocysts, but they have adhesive cells, the chloroblasts that capture prey. They are monoecious with gastrodermal gonads. Okay, so this is a little bit different. There is no polyp phase. Tenophora are completely in a medusa phase, but we don't even call it a medusa, medusa phase because that's just the normal phase of tenophora. A tenophora is both male and female, releases sperm, releases eggs, um, and does not self-fertilize, typically does not self-fertilize. Uh, um, but again, there's no real stationary phase that you would see like you see in Nidarians. They have external fertilization, just like you see in Nideria. Okay? And then they have this flattened larval stage that is either planktonic, 
Okay, so it just moves with the water column, or in some cases they're ciliated and they can swim. So here you can kind of see, superficially again, like I said before, it looks like a jelly. That's why they get the name cone jellies. Okay, but they are different. Okay, they're ectodermis, endodermis, gastrodermis are very similar, but that mesoglea having muscle cells is different than nideria. The fact that they have a mouth and an anal pore, so they have a straight through gastrovascular system. Okay? This makes them a little bit different than you see in Nidarians. Nidarians, that's not the case. Their mouth and anus are in the same spot. Um, the other piece is those tentacles that they have do not have nematocysts. Instead, they have chloroblasts. And those chloroblasts resemble th this kind of structure. So they have these um, ball-like structures okay, at the tips of the chloroblasts that when um, a prey or whatever it might be, even a, even a predator if it comes in contact with the tentacle will get the this will occur these will rupture and release adhesive material that sticks to um, the prey typically this is used in feeding but uh, I mean it can be used in defense mechanisms I guess um, so it will stick to the prey and then this coiled uh, tubing here helps kind of reduce the um, reaction of the prey. So it acts as if it's a spring. So when the adhesive juices grabs onto the prey, that prey can move, but it won't damage the tentacle. It won't rip these chloroblasts off of the tentacle. It, it kind of acts as if a spring and, and it kind of gives it that bounce back ability. And then they consume it in the mouth um, and digest it, etc. All right, so that's Tenophora. Again, like I said, it's not a very big group. Um, there's not a lot of information, but the nice thing about Tenophora is it's showing that connection. It's showing that connection to Nideria, and it's showing the connection to Lophotrichozoa, which is what we're going to talk about next. In that, Lophotrichozoans are triploblastic. Nidarians are diploblastic. Tenophora are like in between. Okay? Uh, most of Lophotrichozoans have a complete digestive system, and I don't mean that they have a stomach and everything like that. I mean that they have a mouth and an anus. A lot of them do. Okay? Now, some of them are secondarily lost, and some don't even have a mouth. We'll talk about this. Um, but at any rate, their digestive system is more com complex than Nidarians and Tenophora is like right in between. So it's it's a really good transitional group showing the transition from being you know two tissue to three tissue being uh, bila or radial symmetry which we see in Nidarians to biradial symmetry which we see in Tenophoras to radial symmetry which we see in Lophotrichozoas. Okay, so you, or I'm sorry <laughs> back Radial symmetry, which we see in Nidarians, biradial symmetry, which we see in Tenophora, and then bilateral symmetry, which we see in Lophotrichozoans. Okay, so you're going from radial symmetric organisms, where you can divide them on a central disc, to bilateral organisms when you're you're dividing them on either a latitudinal or longitudinal plane. Okay. So there's these connections and, that, and that's the nice thing about that tenophora group is it's showing that transition from one uh, body form to the next. Okay. Now when we look at the whole group this is the problematic portion of early primitive animals just like Protista um, in that there's lots of ancestral connections. Um, it's a polyphyletic group. So is the lumping of periphera, nideria, and tenophora. That lumped together okay, is a polyphyletic group. Okay. They each have their own ancestor. Now, this 
again, like I said before, could be a lack of knowledge, or it could be that they don't belong in the same group. You shouldn't group Nidarians and Tenophora with Periphera. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. And it, we just need to hash this out. We need more research done on these groups of organisms and the phylogenetic connections. Now, there are problems with that. Okay? First of all, fossils, like I said before, they're hard to come by. Periphera, we know this, are the oldest fossils in the animal kingdom. Okay? Most of the evidence suggests that channel flagellate ancestral connection okay, with protists or protozoans that were channel flagellates. Okay? Nidarians, same kind of thing. Okay? Channel flagellate ancestors. We do have some old fossils, not quite as old as periphera, but they've been around for a long time. We believe that they had a radial symmetrical ancestor. Okay? And that's because they continuously are radial symmetry or have radial symmetry. Now, there are a few individuals out there currently that still think that the ancestor to Nigeria was a bilateral ancestor. Now, this is definitely the minority view, but it still exists mainly because we don't have enough information. There is not enough information to discern out which ancestral line gave rise to what. The molecular data that's out there right now shows a direct connection to Tenophora, which you should expect because they're very similar to each other. The morphological data suggests a relationship with Tenophora, even um, a direct relationship given that there are Tenophora organisms that have nematocysts, cells that are only found in Nideria. Okay? Well, they're not technically only found in Nideria if Tenophora also have them. Okay? So <clears throat> there's that piece and that connection. Now, how these relationships between Nideria and Tenophora and Periphera, how they relate to Lophotrichozoans or the other groups in the animal kingdom, um, it's difficult. Okay? We know that at least some pieces the fact that you're going from no tissue, two tissues, possibly three tissues, okay, is that evolutionary trend, okay, that you're getting more complex, um, and uh, that complexity becomes more specialized. Okay. But other cases, we just don't have the transitional species, we don't have evidence of them, and we don't have the evidence of the ancestral connection. The last thing I want to talk about is jumping back to Nidarians. Okay? And I should have show, shown this earlier, but Nidarians, when we start working out a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree, um, we know that there's some interesting things that are going on. So we have those five classes that I discussed before, okay? and some of them having very unique structures in the sense that anthrozoas, okay, they are in the polyp phase, there's no medusa phase, sterozoa, there's no medusa phase, and it's not until you get scaphozoa, cubozoa, and hydrozoa where you get that medusa phase. So these are all coral phases, okay? either um, stony coral or even not even producing a um, exoskeleton through car uh, calcium carbonate like uh, sea anemones, okay, they belong to anthrozoa. But nonetheless, these are the more primitive groups that medusa phase is more derived. Okay? But when we look at the entire tree of Nideria, and we look at the base of the tree, we see that all of them are radial, have radial symmetry. And this is where that evidence for the hypothesis of colonial protozoan giving rise to multi-celled organism. Because if it's the colonial protozoan that gave rise to it, they would have radial symmetry. And that's what we see when we look at Nideria. Okay? They all have the planula larvae, so free-swimming larvae, and they have, all have nidocytes. 
okay, those stinging cells capability. Now, sometimes it's epidermal, sometimes it's gastrodermal, sometimes, you know, it's used in feeding, sometimes it's used in defense. Now, that changes depending on um, what group you're in or even um, what species you're looking at, okay? So, the reason why I want to bring this up is it's just more evidence that radial symmetry probably evolved first then bilateral symmetry came next and that's pretty good evidence from the species that exist today periphera has no symmetry the next group are cnidarians they have radial symmetry the next group are tenophora they have biradial symmetry and then the next group are lophotrigozoans and they have bilateral symmetry okay? and so based on that evidence that's why the hypothesis of colonial protozoan or colonial protista has the most evidence. Okay? All right, so next time we're going to talk and switch gears a little bit to another group, a big super group, um, which we call lophotrichozoans.